The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight. We'll be uh, getting started with our panel here in uh, just about two or three minutes. Um, so just bear with us, and we'll be getting going before too much longer. Hi again. For those of you just joining us, we're uh, just getting ready to start. We should be getting going here in about one more minute. So uh, thanks for your patience. We'll be back in just a moment. Hi everyone, thanks again for joining us. We're going to get started now that we've, uh, we've hit the top of the hour. So thanks again for everyone coming in and spending the time out of their day to, uh, to join our panel. Uh, my name is Mark Ayer. Uh, in a moment here I'll introduce our panelists and we'll, we'll get going. The, uh, the format of today's panel is such that we have a number of questions prepared and the, uh, the panelists, which we'll, we'll hear from in just a moment, will be answering them and uh, discussing the, uh, the topic at hand. And then um, during the presentation, I would encourage and, and ask you all to submit to any additional questions that you might have about cloud computing and, and dentistry and uh, the cloud in general. Uh, on your go-to meeting or go-to webinar panel on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see that there is a questions box. Um, any question that you submit there will come through to me, and then, time permitting, at the end of the formal presentation, I'll pose the questions to our various panelists. If you'd like to identify which panel you'd like to question, um, please do so, and I'll, I'll try to get a, a question for you before the end of the uh, of the conversation. Uh, any questions that we don't have time to get to, we'll do our best to answer. Um, via email in a follow-up after the formal presentation ends. And I should also point out that today's session is being recorded. So we'll be sending out a copy of that recording to all the attendees and everyone else who registered for the meeting along with the answers to those questions. So the topic for tonight's conversation, what every dentist should know about the cloud. Um, I think that with all the publicity and the conversations going on around cloud computing today, um, it's getting to be uh, more and more of a of a pressing issue for just about every industry, not just dentistry, but the focus for today is is how it's going to affect dentistry today and 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 well into the future. And to discuss these topics, we've assembled a panel of experts from uh, from around the industry, and I'm going to ask each of them now to uh, to give a, a brief introduction of themselves, and we'll see. 
changing my slide here. And there we are. So um, as you can see, my name is Mark. I'm on the left there. But I'd now like to ask our panelists, um, starting from left to right with, uh, with Rohit Joshi, to introduce yourselves briefly. And then we'll get right into the, uh, the presentation. Rohit? Uh, thanks, Mark. My name is Rohit Joshi. I'm the CEO of Bright Squid Dental. Hi, I'm Andy Jensen. I'm CMO of Curve Dental Incorporated. Hi, I'm Darcy Wingard, Business Development Manager with Demand Force. Hi, I'm Dan Edwards, the president of Pact One Solutions. Thank you, and welcome one and all. Thanks for joining us today and sharing your insights with us. So let's get into the agenda and have a look at what we'll be talking about today. We have um, broken up all of our questions into, into five sections, and we'll go through these five sections. As I said, we'll, I'll be posing questions to each of our panelists. During that, as I mentioned, please um, add any other questions that you have to the uh, the questions panel, and we'll do our best to address each one of them when we get to the end of the uh, the formal presentation. So our first section today is what is the cloud and, and why should it matter to your dental practice? So we're going to be um, looking into well, what the cloud really is and, and how we can be using it today in our practices. So our first question in this section is very simply, what is the cloud? And I'd like to pose that question to, uh, to Dan to start us off tonight. Thank you, Mark. Uh, th there are many different, the cloud means many different things to many different people. Uh, one thing I noticed was Wikipedia defines cloud computing as the use of multiple server-based resources via the internet um, for, for you know, computing your data. Uh, but what the heck does that mean to everybody? Uh, the easiest way I can find to describe that is uh, comparing it to the evolution of public utilities. Back in the industrial age, factories had to produce their own power to run their machines. This put the factory in two businesses, producing their own goods and producing power. Uh, with that, uh, the concept of uh, creating electrical current being generated in central power plants uh, delivered to factories uh, caught on quickly. This meant they no longer had to produce their own power. What made this possible was many uh, was a possible of, uh, what made this possible was a series of inventions and scientific breakthroughs, uh, but what drove demand was pure economics. Utility c companies were able to leverage economies of scale that single manufacturing plants simply couldn't match. In fact, the price of power dropped so significantly that it became affordable not only for factories, but every single household in America. Today, we, we're in a similar transformation following a similar course. The only difference is instead of cheap and plentiful electricity, advancements in technology and internet connectivity are driving down the cost of computing power in the cloud. All right. Uh, thank you for that, Dan. Um, Andy, did you want to uh, add to Dan's answer? Yeah, you know, I've heard that, that compares, comparing the cloud to a utility before, I think it's a great example. Um, as Dan said, you know, most of us share electricity from a common source like a municipality or, you know, a power company. And we do this because as a group we can achieve economies of scale. If I were to try to generate my own electricity for my home, I would spend much more per kilowatt than I do now, as, as Dan said. Mm -hmm. Plus, the electric company is much better at managing my inter energy needs than I am. So back to computing, if I'm sharing infrastructure and hardware on a network with many others, I have access to world-class infrastructure, professional management, and computing power at a fraction of the cost. Right. Okay. Um, thank you very much um, to both of you. Um, let's move on to our, to our next question, which is, what cloud products are appropriate for the, uh, for the dental office? And again, I'll go to Dan um, to start, with on, start us off on this question. Sure. Thanks, Mark. There are many uh, cloud products appropriate for the dental office, and, and many of which are already in use by dental offices, including uh, Facebook, Constant Contact for email and other products like that, Google AdWords, uh, patient communications, uh, secure email, uh, patient education, off-site backup, training, um, and even practice management and your imaging products. So there are many, many products that are appropriate for the dental office. Uh, out there in the cloud. All right, and uh, uh, Rowan, did you want to uh, to pick up on that? Yes, certainly. You know, one of the things that we're seeing uh, right now in the industry is is that the cloud itself is is built um, to do some very specific things that that I think are very interesting in the dental industry. You know, from our perspective, one of the things that's most interesting is 
is that typically a lab, a specialist office, and a dental office will share very different types of systems. You know, the lab will have its own system, the dentist's office will have its own, and the specialist uh, will have its own. One of the advantages of the cloud is is uh, that that the application structure can be shared by anybody who has access to it. So it's a, it's an interesting unifying um, opportunity for various offices to be able to share information. Right. Okay. And um, how can the cloud uh, benefit my practice? And uh, Andy, did you want to uh, jump in on this one, please? Sure. So specific to dentistry and more specifically to dental software, let me quickly list five ways in which the cloud can benefit the practice. The first has to do with hardware and infrastructure. The cloud lets you use super expensive servers, super tough security measures, and super smart network guys to uh, benefit your practice. So rather than buying and building all of that yourself, which would cost millions, um, you can just rely on that infrastructure through the cloud. Example, um, you know, you go down to, to Walmart and you buy a router for $60 and you're going to depend on that firewall to keep your patient data safe versus the commercial grade routers used by professionally managed data centers to keep your patient data safe. Um, another example, backup and storage benefits. The cloud is the perfect foundation for a workable business continuity plan. Um, it's off-site, it's secure, it doesn't rely on your office manager who has little of any professional IT training, and it's accessible from anywhere. Let's also look at work style flexibility. The cloud is more conducive to where or when you wish to work. Dentistry is not a nine to five job. It's a profession, and as such, dentists get calls after hours and on weekends. So with your practice on the cloud, using a cloud-based dental software system, you have access to all of your patient data at any time from anywhere. I mean, work style is a big deal these days. Um, I think women dentists find this benefit more beneficial. Uh, we have a, a customer who is a working mom dentist. She works 40 hours a week at the practice, and uh, she tries to raise her family at the same time. So at night when she puts her kids to bed, she has an opportunity to pop open her laptop and access her patient records and, and finish up whatever notes have to be finished up for the day. Another one is easier HIPAA compliance. If you have a server sitting in your practice, the government wants to know how you're keeping that data safe. In fact, there are 19, I think 19 physical and technical requirements to meet just to have that server in your practice. So you take the server out of the equation and you've eased the burden of keeping up with, with the government what they want you to do. And then the last, perhaps, is installation setup. If you have traditional client server dental software in your office, and I refer um, think back on what it took to get your software installed and configured and ready to rumble. Compare that chore with cloud-based software where you simply connect to the internet, navigate to the login page, enter your username and password, and you're in. I didn't install any software, and I, um, it can't get any easier than that. <laughs> That's a good point. There's some really good points, Andy. Um, uh, Dan, did you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, Andy made a, a lot of great points there, and I just wanted to add that, you know, Right now, uh, cloud-based practice management and imaging is, is, is a great solution. It just may not be the right solution for everybody, but it, it definitely, you know, it, it simplifies the, uh, the infrastructure for the practice. Of course. Okay. Uh, thanks for, to both of you for those, for those answers. Let's move on now to the, uh, to the next slide, trying to keep things on schedule here today. And our next question is, um, what if I lose my internet connection, which I suppose is a, is a risk that we always ha all have. Um, Andy, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, internet connectivity quality and dependability vary from area to area. Generally speaking, if the internet does go down in the area, trucks are willing to fix it. Why? Because the internet is a utility. It's not just that you lost connectivity, it's that everyone in your neighborhood lost connectivity and the company is racing to fix that. Conversely, if you have a server go down in your office, who cares? Probably just you. The only person that cares is you and you're going to call your IT pro and if he's busy, he'll get to it as quickly as he can. If he's not busy, he's still, what, an hour or, or so away from, from helping you out. Now, Dan has a really smart and intelligent answer to this question, so I'll leave him to that. But just let me say that I hear this question often from doctors who are not on the cloud. 
what if the internet goes down? But I rarely hear this from curved demo customers who are already on the cloud. They rarely say anything about internet outages, probably because it doesn't really happen that often, generally speaking. I mean, it hasn't happened in my neighborhood since I switched on to DSL five or six years ago. In a pinch, it is possible to pull out your smartphone and create a hotspot. I mean, this connection to the internet will let you schedule, it will let you chart, it will let you bill, create notes. Um, for digital imaging, it may not be able to handle that, but it will get you by in a pinch. But like I said, Dan has a better answer to this question, I think. All right, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, it, the internet in this day and age, it, it does rarely go down, uh, but just just like with anything you do on the internet, I mean, if you're using Facebook or you're banking, if the internet goes down for just a little bit, it it, it doesn't matter as much right at that moment. You can you can get back to it later. But if your internet goes down while you're practice management, while you're using your practice management, it does it, it impacts your practice. So even in larger cities, I've had a few examples of of offices where they've had a you know somebody digging somewhere down the street and it's cut a fiber line that that takes down the internet for sometimes up to a whole day. So what we usually recommend offices going to the cloud is that they get multiple uh, redundant business class internet connections uh, and the router that can handle that. That way you, when well, you're going to the cloud to make sure you're up all the time and you reduce your infrastructure, you want to make sure that you are up all the time and have access to your data every time you need it when patients are in the chair. Mm -hmm. So re really good points in there, especially about uh, you know if the internet goes down, a lot of people are working on it and trying to fix it, which is a lot different from what happens inside someone's office. So uh, thank you very much for those uh, for those questions and answers there. Too. So next, our next question is: um, Are other practices doing this? I mean, how common is this going to the cloud trend right now, and and what's happening out there? So uh, Andy. Uh, well, Mark, on the, on the medical side, physicians have moved their practice to the cloud in droves. Um, a lot of physicians are, are managing their practices on the cloud now. Adoption on the dental side is slower, and there might be some reasons here. Maybe, um, well, for most medical practices, they employ IT talent, and so these guys can, uh, can ob objectively guide the practice to better technology. Dentists are entrepreneurs. They're small business owners. They may not know that but they wear many hats and they receive very little IT training in dental school. I mean, to my knowledge, none of the dental schools are providing their students with IT training. Laugh, laugh. To my knowledge, all the schools are still using client server software. So even the, the schools need to um, take, a, take a leap there. So, and let's face it, technology in the dental space is pretty much dominated by a small number of players who at the moment don't have a financial reason to promote the cloud there to customers. I think that's gonna change here quickly. Despite that, dental practices are moving away from client-server software to the cloud for all the same reason we, reasons we discussed earlier. As an example, more than 1,000 dental professionals are using Curve Dental every day to manage their practices, all on the cloud. And I think, I think Darcy can add to the number of doctors who are using her cloud-based service. Um, yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, I mean, today we have a little over um, 12,000 individual locations in dental, just in dental, utilizing our um, online communication and marketing services. And, you know, quarter by quarter we see this number um, growing. So in dental specifically, and just like you said, Andy, you know, I think that, you know, dental specifically can have some late adopters, but one thing through my marketing background and expertise is, you know, dentists need to be doing things that are different. Things and times have changed. And so to stay top of mind with your patients, you need to make sure that you are staying on top of technology and, you know, you need to be connected where your patients are and their patients are online. Great. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, it's good to hear from everyone and get all kinds of different opinions. We'll move on now to our next section. And, and while I'm doing that, I should uh, point out we've had quite a few questions coming in. It's been quite a flurry of activity here. So we're going to get to all those at the end. But uh, I'd still encourage everyone to submit additional questions, and we'll do our best to answer them as best we can. Now, our next section is something very important and near and dear to all of our hearts, which is, of course, patient privacy in the cloud. Uh, Doctor-patient confidentiality is, of course, not a new, uh, new concept by any stretch of the imagination, but we need to think differently about it when it comes to cloud-based computing and just digital data in general. So our first question 
Uh, I'm going to uh, read it and then we'll address it to, uh, to Roa Joshi. Uh, are there any HIPAA or PIPIDA concerns with cloud-based technology? Now, Rohit, as our, as our resident lawyer on the panel, I'll turn this question over to you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mark. Um, uh, certainly. Uh, there are HIPAA and PIPIDA concerns, uh, HIPAA being the American uh, legislation, PIPIDA being the Canadian legislation, with cloud-based technology. You know, I've been speaking about HIPAA and PIPIDA laws for the past few years, and it's probably worthwhile just taking a quick step back. Um, Something that tends to get lost is the underlying reason uh, for these regulations is really focused around uh, doctor-patient confidentiality. You know, there's real-world examples where, where HIPAA laws are met because, because people uh, restrict the labels that are on their um, patient files, or they change the viewability of their monitor so that every uh, patient that walks in can't see the schedule so that uh, every patient isn't revealed. Well, the same is true of the electronic world, and that's where things, I think, get a little more interesting from a cloud perspective. There's a number of different principles that have to get met for the electronic world while trying to keep patient data private. So um, there's regulations that, uh, that involve um, who has access to that information. Um, how did that transmission of that data occur on the cloud? Um, how does the storage occur? What happens when the data is stored in the computers on the cloud? How is that data archived, and what are the regulations that are required in order to meet that? So there's, you know, there's a number of electronic world type of requirements that match very closely with the real world. Um, so in, as a quick answer, there are certainly concerns. Um, and, uh, and having said that, there are a number of vendors, very good vendors, that are in the industry that are looking after uh, uh, the concerns that might be uh, having at the practice. The truth is that HIPAA and PIPIDA should be a concern at the practice in any case. Um, and the cloud actually can simplify a lot of the concern at the practice. Uh, thanks very much, Rod. There's a lot of good information in there. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in. I'll just give you a second. No, no takers on this one. So then we'll just move on to the next question, which is, um, are cloud-based are cloud-based backup solutions secure, and how do you choose the correct solution for your practice? And uh, Dan, I'll let you start on this one, please. Uh, sure, thanks, Mark. Uh, the uh, there are many different uh, cloud-based solutions out there, and they're, they're definitely a majority of them are secure. It's really uh, making sure that the uh, the cloud-based backup solution that you choose is uh, is secure, uh, meets uh, HIPAA compliancy and uh, that the company knows uh, dental and medical and, and all the requirements that are needed. Along with that, with the new uh, HIPAA, HIPAA Omnibus rule, which goes into effect September 23rd, uh, you'll need to make sure that the entity that is backing up your data online is willing to sign a business associate agreement with you as well, um, is just like any other business associate you work with. Uh, some of the things to look for are making sure that it's, it's encrypted and uh, there's redundant data centers, uh, preferably stored in different parts of the country, um, and it's easy to restore and easy to get your data back should you have issues. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Rohit? Uh, thanks. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think Dan's uh, answer was excellent. In fact, you know, we've been asked this question so much about how do you choose that correct solution that uh, we've created a checklist. And if you, if you just put you know, checklist down in the question box, we'll we'll get uh, a list of those afterwards. We're we're happy to send that to you after the webinar. And and as Dan was saying, you know, there's a number of requirements. You know, uh, even for example, are the people at the data, data center where that information is being hosted, or is the training up to speed? You know, where is the data located? Because those are important questions for particularly Canadian practices. Um, is there a business associates agreement? And I think, Dan, uh, you've already mentioned that. So um, I'd encourage you, if you are interested, just to, to put checklist in the, in, the, uh, in the question box, and we'll make sure we, we send one out for you. Uh, thanks, Roit, and uh, the checklist has gotten very popular in the chat window right now, so we have a lot of people asking for that information, so we'll pass it on to you a little bit later. So on to our, on to our next section, which is, um, you know, as we can see, using the cloud to market your practice, uh, the cloud being kind of a new entity to some of us. 
um, this is uh, probably an important question that uh, I think needs to be addressed. So let's go to the, to the first question, which is, um, why is collecting patients' online information so important? And for this, I'll, I'll ask Darcy to start us off, please. Thanks again, Mark. Um, yeah, just to kind of piggyback on what I said earlier about moving online and working on the cloud, um, your patients are online. That is what everybody's kind of trending to. And like I said again, you know, things just aren't working the way they used to. Um, so actually through many reports that it actually shows that collecting patients' online contact information is more important than even grabbing a physical address or a phone number. Um, I believe the last um, kind of data metrics that I was able to receive a couple weeks ago was 85% of Americans actually own a mobile smart device. That is a staggering, very large number. And so when you see facts like that, that means probably close to 85% of your patients in your practice they are on tablets, they are on smartphones, and we're finding that 60% of the people that are utilizing any type of cell phones, they're not using them to make calls, they're using them to, you know, check emails, to connect with their friends, to use um, applications. So if you are using any type of online communication platform or you're sending any type of um, emails, you know those are going to be delivered right to your patients and they're going to be able to respond to those with one click of a button when it's convenient for them. And I think again, the convenience part of that is key. You want to make sure you're communicating with your patients the way they want to be communicated by. So I guess again, another thing that I always like to tell our dental professionals to do is take a walk outside into your um, waiting area or your waiting front room and see how many patients are in their lobby waiting and do a little head count of how many patients are sitting there working on a tablet or a smartphone. And it's probably going to be, you know, five to one there. Yeah, some really good points there, Darcy. In fact, I wonder why I still call my smartphone a phone when I hardly ever use it as a phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andy, we haven't heard from you in a while. Did you want to join in? Andy, are you still there? If you on mute? Yes, I think... I think Darcy hit the main points here. I especially liked her comment on on um, convenience. Um, from the patient's perspective, you know, I find the opportunity to communicate with my doctor via email very liberating. When you're sitting in the operatory as a patient, you never have any questions when the doctor says, do you have any questions? You always have those questions later. And it's great to be able to communicate with your doctor later about what uh, you may be experiencing. And then being able to pay your bills online, that, that saves a lot of time. From the doctor's perspective, marketing capabilities are so much more powerful um, online without an equal increase in marketing expenditures. And those acti activities are instantaneous. Um, every practice must really make the gathering of email addresses and cell phone numbers a uh, part of their daily routine. All right, thank you very much. So, our next question, uh, is it important for practices to have a Facebook fan page? And again, I'll turn to, uh, to Darcy to start us off on this one. Yeah, um, so again, what we talk about is some of the patient behavior and consumer behavior changing, and um, Facebook is one of the fastest growing um, communication sites, and it's even trumped Google. There are more users on Facebook and actively working with Facebook and the applications there, connecting through messages, posting on walls, um, you know, what have you. And it's very important that practices take advantage of these social media tools, any type of social sites. And another thing when you talk about, you know, expenses and overheads is Facebook's free. All social media is free. So I think any vehicle and any asset that you can take advantage of, especially in social media, you need to do it. Your patients are on Facebook, they're connected there, and I know for referrals, when you look at new patient acquisition, this is a great way to communicate with patients because they're able to like any type of images that you're um, posting on your fan page, and all their friends in turn will see the activity that they've liked or that they've posted on you, and then reporting analytics. You know, you're able to track all these kind of things, and there are a lot of different automated tools out there today that can kind of track the success of the Facebook posts that you're managing. So you can see, are people really liking my page? Are they sharing the content that's there? And again, if you 
kind of add in a little personal element into your um, the content that you're posting onto your social sites that helps you know you communicate and kind of bond on a more personal level with your patients, um, especially if you're using widgets like requesting appointments, um, you know, even reviews. If you have patient testimonials, it's a great way for you to stream that raving fan base and help attract new patients by leveraging those patients that love you. Um, we talk about convenience with requesting appointments. Once again, with one click of a button, they're able to connect with you 24 hours and say, hey, I need to come in, I want to see you, and all that can be tracked. So again, I mean, when any type of technology is moving forward and those social sites are available for you, you have to take advantage of where your patients are. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Making that, that personal connection has always been so important, and uh, with these new tools, it's, uh, it's easier than ever before in, in many, many ways. So our next question, um, I guess, ties into what we were just saying is, you know, how has patient behavior changed in the way that they might refer a friend? Uh, and again, uh, Darcy? Yeah, so kind of, again, just to piggyback on just what I was saying, that patient behavior definitely has changed. Um, obviously, no matter where technology goes and how it does change and how, is it, how it expands, I still truly believe that, um, you know, the best way to grab a new patient is obviously by the referral. But that referral process has changed. Um, when you have social sites and um, big search engines and giants such as Google or Bing or Yelp, um, you know, your reputation is key when it comes to attracting that new patient base. Um, even if my friend tells me to check out this new restaurant or go to this new salon or use the dentist that she's been going to for five years, um, the first thing I'm still going to do, even though I trust my friend, is I'm going to search for that professional or that practice online. And when I type in that doctor's name or phone number, if the first thing I don't see is a website or a social site or any type of reviews that kind of comes full circle and shows that he's a legitimate source and I can see feedback and see contact information, you know, that's what I'm going to look for. And if that's not there, you know, I might be going and looking for something else. So patient behavior is changing. It's going to always be evolving. And again, this is why it's so important to make sure you have some sort of platform to grab those um, online reviews and reputation management programs. Oh, pardon me. Um, I think my audio dropped out for a second. So thanks very much, Darcy. We'll move on now to, to the next section, where we'll be talking about uh, managing your practice in the cloud. Um, so you know, tying into the uh, to marketing, but now getting into management. Let's take a look at our first couple of questions there. So to start with, what are the differences between cloud-based and client-server uh, practice management systems? And uh, Dan, if you could start us off here. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Uh, the, there are there are differences between the the two solutions, and, and there's different ways to look at cloud-based uh, solu uh, technologies. There's uh, different types. There's ones where you're storing your images locally but running a web-based practice management. Uh, there's and there's true cloud-based solutions where everything is being run in the cloud, uh, and this can be a great solution while being uh, scary at the same time to the practices. Uh, client server based uh, solutions require a local server in your office. Um, it is my personal belief that the local server solution still offers the fastest speed for both access to your patient data and x-ray images while you're in your practice. Uh, and this will continue to change and advance as cloud technologies uh, advance further and internet speeds continue to increase. Uh, there are potential downfalls to both options with cloud-based solutions uh, relying on the internet, which we addressed earlier, um, along with relying on a company and making sure the company you choose uh, is uh, keeps your data accessible and is, is HIPAA compliant. Uh, with client server solutions, uh, you need a quality business class server, which you, you have to purchase, and a local qualified dental integrator to help you with that, with that solution. Um, whichever solution you choose, uh, it's making sure you you know you use your due diligence, do your due diligence to figure out which solution is right for your practice at the point you need the solution. Uh, not one solution is right for everybody. 
All right, and uh, Andy? Well, Mark, I think, am I the only person who thinks it's kind of funny that the marketing guy is following up on the IT guy's comments on, co on technology? <laughs> I think that's kind of funny. I mean, it's really the chance of a lifetime. So I'm going to say, I think you got it right, Dan. That's awesome. But basic, basically speaking, if you have to take a disk and put it into your computer to install the software, I guess that's, that's client-server software. It's decades-old technology. Um, I call it fossil fuel software just for fun. Um, Cloud-based dental software offers just as many advantages for the software developer as the end user. For example, when I worked for Dentrix a long time ago, when faced with a newly discovered bug, the team would lament, you know, if we were only on the cloud, we'd be able to fix this bug for all of our users in a heartbeat. I mean, the cloud is today's current platform. And what I mean by this is, is, is Dan, if you were to get a crazy idea to create a new software company, you would develop the software for the cloud, right? Uh, yes, I would. So why? Because the cloud is a de facto standard when it comes to software development. The cloud is not the future. It is today's platform standard. And if you're not on the cloud, you're using old technology. Oh, sorry, I was waiting for a rebuttal there. I thought there'd be more back and forth with Dan. <laughs> but let's, uh, let's move on to the next question. Thank you very much uh, for that, Andy. So how can you manage your practice in the cloud? Um, what about things like charting, billing, scheduling, and, uh, and, and imaging? And Andy, since you're on a roll, you can just carry right on, please. Um, well, how can I use the cloud to plan treatment across different offices? Um, if you're using the cloud, if your patient database is in the same spot, I'm going to address this with, the, with two practices, um, same doctor with a different patient base perhaps, and you have patients that are going from one office to the next. Uh, with Curve Dental, you'd be able to access that patient's record regardless of what physical location you're in. So if they're visiting uh, uh, practice A, for example, one week and they're in practice B the next month, um, that data is still available to them. Okay. And uh, Rowan? Uh, sure, Mark. I think, you know, what, what we've seen um, to be particularly interesting um, around managing the practice is that so much of um, the practice involves other participants. So, uh, for example, you know, for a dentist uh, working with a specialist about a treatment, or for the for, for the lab to be able to work with their dentist or or, or others, um, and what we're seeing now actually is um, the the lab wanting to work with the milling center and and the dentist wanting to work with uh, someone that just has a radiology practice and does all of the imaging for them, and so what what we're really recognizing is that, is the cloud is a great platform to enable that kind of management, so that we can see multiple different players. Um, using the same piece of software to collaborate on a single patient. Uh, and that's what we're finding very exciting. And, 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 of course, the cloud lends itself to exactly that type of work. Right. Thank you very much. So I think that brings us to the end of this section. Um, so while I'm getting into the next, uh, the next section, I'll remind everyone that, well, we have had a lot of questions come in. We have a f uh, room for a few more. So feel free to, uh, to throw your questions towards the panelists, and uh, we'll address as many as we can before we get back to the top of the hour. So moving on to our, to our, our next section, which is uh, collaboration in the cloud, I think here we'll be talking a little bit about how, uh, how everyone's working together and sharing information uh, through these cloud-based systems. So our first question in this section is, what is the benefit of using a cloud-based service over a standard email to share patient data? And for that, I'll ask Rowan to start us, please. Uh, thanks, Mark. Yeah, as you can, you can kind of tell, my passion really is in trying to understand how to, how to use the cloud to enable this type of collaboration. Um, I know that with the many practices that I've been visiting and, and many labs that I've been visiting, that a lot of that information is shared uh, over email. Uh, typically, uh, Microsoft Outlook um, in the practice, uh, connecting to a Gmail or connecting to AOL in some cases, um, to actually be the email provider that sends that type of information back and forth. Um, the reality behind all of that, though, is that email in that form is absolutely not compliant with HIPAA laws or with HIPAA laws. And so in that manner, um, email is illegal to be using to share patient data. Um, if you take that a step further, it's a little bit off topic, but one of the other things I see a lot in practices 
is the use of a Dropbox or a Google Drive. Again, neither of those are qualified uh, uh, to hold patient data. So if you're using them now in your practices, you are making a mistake. Now, the opportunity, if we look at this less from a negative perspective and say, what's the benefit of using a cloud-based service? Well, the first benefit is that, well, you're going to be compliant. You're going to be legal with everything that uh, the laws uh, in, in North America um, are asking for. Um, so you will, it will automatically be backed up. It will um, have uh, um, uh, encryption, so that will be unaccessible for, uh, uh, through various means. So there's, there's that benefit, which is your compliant. The other benefit with systems like ours, like uh, our, our system is called Secure Mail. We actually have the opportunity of uploading some very large files um, uh, through the system. And I think I've got a couple of um, questions here later on where I can go into a little more detail. But the opportunity to upload, for example, a 500 megabyte cone beam CT scan or a 3D STL file or even a series of high resolution images for the aesthetically conscious uh, dentist, um, all of those are, are possible in a system um, that doesn't sort of limit you to a 10 megabyte or 20 megabyte like, like Gmail would or, or LiveMail would. So I think there's, there's the benefits not only of being compliant, but certainly also um, the benefits of having a tool that's been uh, specifically designed to share uh, that type of patient data. Right. Thank you very much. And then, uh, Dan, did you have something to add? Uh, no, I just wanted to. Well, I just wanted to add a little bit. Uh, the Dropbox is definitely it, it's something we see a lot in in offices where they try to share images with Dropbox, and we try to educate uh, offices on why that isn't compliant. Um, as well as I agree with um, everything that was said about uh, you know making sure that you're using some type of secure uh, sharing method that is that is HIPAA compliant to um, make sure that you meet all those requirements as you share images back and forth between. Uh, insurance companies and and other uh, practices you work with. Okay, thank you very much. Now, in our next question, uh, is can I use the cloud to plan treatment across different offices? And we've uh, we've talked with this a little bit earlier on, but I think that uh, Rowan, if you have some some thoughts on this, um, I certainly do. Thanks, Mark. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I actually have to say is pretty impressive with, with the firms that have started to adopt our software, we're starting to see some very interesting um, uh, treatment planning. Uh, from, from our perspective, what we're starting to see is, uh, a, spe is, is a, a, a general practitioner who then might send the patient to an orthodontist. But as a part of that treatment plan, there needs to be some teeth extracted, so they end up sending them to an oral surgeon. And, and that type of treatment coordination is terrifically interesting um, on a common platform because there's, there's no sort of analog. It, it's not as though there is something that people are doing now other than multiple faxes, you know, couriers, um, sometimes phone calls, and in order to kind of duplicate that process. So it's, it's been very exciting for us to watch the growth of sort of uh, that type of treatment planning. Um, in addition to what's happening there is now the, the GP who's, who, who really owns that patient kind of is able to keep track of where that patient is from a scheduling standpoint so that a, the, 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 the dentist knows that if that patient has missed an appointment that was planned or missed getting his, the, the oral surgery appointment, they now understand that that's going to obviously have an impact as to, how, as to when that patient is going to re return to them. So, uh, so it's been very interesting to see how that's uh, been developing uh, over our system over the past number of number of years. We're actually now at the point where, where if that patient misses that appointment, new dates can automatically be scheduled, and everyone on the on the team notified that here's the new dates for that type of uh, uh, for that patient to be um, uh, completing treatment. The other thing that kind of follows in with all that is that um, is that it's possible in this multi-practitioner treatment for each practitioner to upload the information that's relevant to them. So if, if I am the, the oral surgeon, I can up, update sort of that part of the treatment that I'm responsible for so that now the orthodontist knows and also the GP knows 
what's happened with that patient in that phase of treatment. So anyways, I, I, the reason I like, uh, I'm so excited about this is it, it doesn't really have a, a real world or an, uh, an analog other than lots of phone calls between lots of dedicated people who are trying to get things right for that patient. Yeah, it, it almost sounds like you're changing the definition of the word team um, with some of these, these tools throughout. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that, Mark. You know, we, we, we've, when we have uh, started to talk about our product, we really call it around a, a, a treatment team. And by team, we mean everybody who's involved in delivering that treatment to that patient. Exactly. Now, um, now Andy, you had your hand up earlier. Did you want to uh, chime in on this, or should I just move on to the next question? I just wanted to say that, you know, that, that, that the collaboration um, issue becomes really exciting because of the cloud, and it makes it a lot easier. Um, if you look at curved dental example, I mean, you can schedule appointments, you can complete a clinical chart, you can chart a perio exam, cancer, digital x-rays, all these types of things. Um, the cloud provides an opportunity or a platform to, to move that information beyond the practice, as Rohit's been explaining to us, and it's really exciting. Absolutely. Thanks very much. So I think we're on to our, our last of the, uh, of the prepared questions, and we'll get into the, uh, to the other ones. So if you have any, any more questions, now is a good time to, to submit them. And so the last question is, you know, how can I use the cloud to monitor treatment progress from specialists through labs? And again, I'll turn to Rowan for this one. Thanks, Mark. I think may, I may have jumped the gun a little bit and talked a bit about mm -hmm. how, our, how, how the product can be used or how the cloud can be used, rather, to, um, to, to plan across the specialists and the, the GP. Um, what's interesting as well is, is how um, I've seen the adoption of the cloud in, in terms of the communications between the labs and the GP. Now, again, this is somewhere where I'm seeing a, a great deal of email go back and forth. Um, we work with some very large labs that probably receive hundreds of emails which have patient images in them um, and of course the subject line is the patient name. Um, you know, again, absolutely non-compliant, not legal. Now when, when I'm starting to see uh, on, on compliance systems is the ability for the lab, well first of all to receive the files um, uh, in a very cohesive way. And What I mean by that is um, the, if there are many uh, dentists who want to send high resolution images to their lab. Now, there's one of two options to do that we're using a typical email system. Uh, the first way is to reduce the size of that image um, so that they can put the five or ten images inside of one email and then that will get sent. Unfortunately when the lab receives it, the images are typically so small that they lose the value they were intended to, uh, to communicate. Uh, the other thing that I actually have seen uh, recently was one particular lab that was receiving 10 emails in a row from one dentist about one patient. And that was because they wanted to send 10 high resolution images from about what was, what was going on for that patient. You can imagine the, the frustration uh, on, on everybody's side if that's, if that's what's going on. So what happens, um, what, what can happen now with the cloud is uh, the lab first of all can receive all of that information and then they can also post status updates. You know, the, the number one question that we've um, had from the labs is you know, how, do, how do I show the dentist the updates or how can I communicate with the dentist easier? Because typically they've got a bank of, of people answering the phone you know, to, to answer the, the question of where is my stuff at. And, uh, and, and with, with uh, a cloud-based solution um, like BrightSquid, there's an opportunity for that uh, dentist, uh, dental office to simply log in and have a look at the status um, of where, that, uh, uh, where the restoration is and um, actually to just get the tracking number directly from uh, the lab so they don't even have to call in to get that type of information. So it's, uh, it's been very exciting again in, uh, in, in the transition as, as, as the labs are, are adopting uh, cloud technologies for that purpose of collaboration and communication. Um, uh, we're, we're quite excited about it. The other thing again, uh, uh, just before I finish on this point, um, part of monitoring the treatment progress may be going back and forth with, you know, how does this look to you? or you know, uh, or, or other things that the lab wants to share back with the dentist. And, and with some of the new technologies, 
one of the opportunities that we're seeing is you know the 3D STL images. So um, uh, the dentist can log in, look at a 3D image of their restoration, and uh, uh, ask for some changes or approve it. Um, all of that can happen on uh, uh, over the cloud, and, uh, and all very exciting with with where dentistry is heading. Um, uh, and and we're we're kind of uh, got front row seats uh, for all of that because the cloud is uh, is taking over a lot of that challenge. Uh, thanks very much, Road. And as this is our our last formal question, I'll I'll open the floor if anyone else wants to jump in. Uh, if not, then I'll get into the questions that were posed by our our attendees. All right. So no takers on that. So I'm going to uh, advance our slides one more section here. And uh, as everyone can see on the screen right now, here is the the contact information and some other and some offers from our our four panelists today and their organizations. Uh, please uh, do reach out to them and, and ask for additional information or or whatever you uh, whatever you might need to know. But let's get into the actual questions. As I mentioned, we've had quite a few come in while we were talking, so I probably won't be able to answer everyone's. But uh, my first question here um, is is. I think something that most of the panelists will probably chime in on. So um, how do you switch from an in-office system to a cloud-based system? And I'll ask uh, Dan if you could um, address that first, and then Andy, I'll probably get you to, uh, to comment on this as well. Dan? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, most, the, the way that most offices would do it, would, and depending upon the cloud product that they use, would be to uh, send off a copy or have a copy uh, uploaded from the practice management software that you're switching to uh, to them so they can do a conversion of the data. Uh, it's usually a very painless process uh, as long as the, uh, the data that you currently have is, is in good shape and, and doesn't uh, need any cleaning up. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the basic gist of it. Um, after your data is uploaded to a secure site, we have a data conversion team that takes the data and converts it to a format that's compatible with the Curve Dental database, and then you're up and running. All right. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have any comments on that before I move on to the next question? So our next question is, um, how practical is cloud-based how practical is a cloud-based practice with regard to digital radiography uh, and large file, and large sizes of files? Um, uh, Rod, I'm going to ask you to address this since uh, you talked about this a little bit earlier on, but I think that Dan and, and Andy might have some comments afterwards. So the question, one more time, because I fumbled it to begin with, is how practical is cloud-based practices with regard to digital radiography and the large file sizes? Uh, Rod? Sure. Sure. Uh, you know, we're working with uh, a couple of radiology image, uh, imaging um, uh, practices now, and so their entire business in order to communicate those radiographs to the comb beam CT scans is online, and it is through our system. And, and so for those uh, um, products, what typically happens is um, they've got a very good connection to the Internet, and uh, they do it multiple times a day in order to get that information up to the cloud. Uh, for those receiving that information, you would also want to ensure that, that they had a good system in place. Um, but uh, I know the viewer that we use, and I suspect, Andy, um, uh, you can talk about what Curve Dental uses, um, but, but uh, the, the system that we use, you actually don't have to di download that image to view. Uh, the cone beam CT scan, you can simply scroll it online. So the recipient of that information doesn't need to have a strong, uh, a, a very thick internet connection, uh, unlike the, the, the company that's uploading it. Uh, Andy, maybe you can jump in here as well. Yeah, that, we, that's, that's correct. I mean, I hear this from doctors a number of times is, you know, how do you, how do you handle x-rays? And, um, and I'm speaking specifically about, uh, you know, your, your bite wing x-rays. Um, if you stop and think about it, we're talking about a black and white image, um, and it really isn't that 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 big of a deal. I mean, my wife is uploading uh, images to Facebook by the terabytes every day, and it doesn't seem to be a problem for her. So w we have a patented process that allows you to capture that digital X-ray directly to the cloud, so it doesn't reside on the hard drive, um, and it, it just goes directly to the cloud. And like you were saying, Roy. It, um, you can view that image without downloading the image. So it's very, 
it is very practical. We have practices that are, are doing this every day. Right. Um, any response on that, Rod? Uh, no, just to uh, agree um, uh, with with Andy. This is uh, it's something again that can come up as a resistance, um, but but certainly you know uh, um, both Andy and I are seeing this happen, you know, every day and multiple multiple times a day. Mm -hmm. So our next question is very much in the same vein. So to, to the two of you, um, since it contains confidential patient data, what measures are in place from data security access perspective? Will Curve or any other technical support team have access to the practice data? Now, um, Dan, or sorry, Andy, I'll have you answer this first, but I'm sure that uh, both Dan and Rowett will have comments. So once again, I'll read that question. Since it contains confidential patient data, what measures are in place from a data security access perspective, and will Curve technical support teams have access to practice data? Uh, Andy? Well, it's certainly, it's certainly more secure than having your patient data sitting on a server in your practice, and here's why. From a physical standpoint, the, uh, it, it, with a, a, data, a data management center, there's physical um, uh, security. You've got a fence. You have uh, not anyone can enter the building. There is a security alarm, and some of these places are actually a, a security guard there 24/7. So, from a physical standpoint, it's it's much more secure. Um, from an electronic standpoint, it's much more secure in that your data is redundant. So, if there is any type of disaster, fire, flood, you're not going to lose that data. And as I said earlier, you're using um, hardware that is um, commercial grade rather than something that is picked up at Radio Shack or, or whatever. Um, now as far as is, uh, is, your, is your practice data access, accessed by support teams, yes, we have a BA agreement signed with every one of our customers. When, they call, when a customer calls in for technical assistance, of course, we can access their database and view what they're viewing, and we can answer and resolve the issue much, much faster. Um, we do have a process in place making sure that we know who is accessing whose data at any given time. All right. And, Ro, did you want to chime in on this one, please? Yeah, yeah, sure, uh, Mark. You know, there's, there's a number of uh, safeguards that we've got in place, and, and I'll just pick up on the last thing that Andy said, which was, one of the one of the elements of the HIPAA requirements is to ensure that there's a log of every access to every bit of data, and and so what we've done is uh, we've built that into everything that we do. So every activity is logged. Now we we've restricted it, it by a large measure anybody that has access to data. I, for example, um, would have no need to access that data. Therefore, I don't access that data and actually wouldn't know how to access practice data. We do have, you know, our most senior software developer does understand the database well enough to have access to that. However, all of his activities are recorded in a log that he doesn't have access to. Only I have access to that. So there's a number of safeguards in place that are, that are quite complex from a technical standpoint to ensure that exactly the question that was asked, which is who has access to the data, well, well nobody that shouldn't. <laughs> the age-old question of who watches the Watchmen, I suppose, and now we know the answer to that. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we just have uh, a few minutes left here, so I have one quick question for Dan, and then we'll be wrapping up. Uh, and this question is, um, how do I maintain cloud-based software? Dan? Well, uh, that would probably be, uh, I mean, it depends on the cloud-based software that we're talking about. Uh, that might be a better question for, for Andy on, on actually... Um, on a cloud-based practice management, we're talking about other cloud-based softwares. It's making sure that whatever it is, whether it be backup, uh, any type of uh, file sharing, anything like that, that you make sure that all of it is is HIPAA compliant, is always up to date. Uh, and even with a cloud-based product like uh, uh, like Curve Dental, uh, make sure that your operating system on your computer is always up to date and secure from viruses, even though you're using a cloud-based product. Like you need to pr protect someone from hacking your computer and viewing that data remotely. All right, and uh, Andy, since uh, Dan called you out, <laughs> I guess he owed me one on that one. Uh, I think that's um, obviously your hardware needs to be maintained, just like any other type of hardware needs to be maintained. But as far as the software is concerned, there is, you never have to worry about upgrades. That's always being done behind the scenes. Whenever you log into the software. 
you're always using the latest and greatest features and the most powerful features that, that can benefit your practice. I love that about the cloud because that you're always using what's new and exciting. All right, great. And we're just bumping up against the top of the hour now. I just have one last question for all of our panelists. So I'd like to ask all four of you to, to give this a little bit of thought and get back to me with a, with a short answer. And we'll go in the same order that we started with, with, uh, with Rohit, then, uh, then Andy, uh, Darcy, and Dan. And my question to you is, what do you think will be the biggest change in the way doctors and dentists are using cloud-based services over the next five years? Rohit? Uh, interesting question. I think uh, well, uh, just as we started off, you know, I think Dan gave a good example of how you know, there's a sense of, of this utility. And I think that's very much how, how over the next five years people are going to recognize that the Internet is always on. It's the preferred method uh, on how to communicate and collaborate and operate um, mm -hmm. because it, it reduces the complexity of the office management around software so considerably. Andy? Yeah, Rohit really, really, really said that well. It's, it's the preferred method of communicating, whether we're communicating with our patients or communicating with our staff even, or other doctors, the internet is the way to go. I, I'm, I'm really excited about the future. I don't think that we really know um, I mean, if we could jump ahead three years from now and look back and, and say, wow, we were really antiquated three years ago, and look what we're doing now. Um, at Curve Dental, when we sit down in, in development meetings, uh, sometimes we get way out there and we have to dial it back and say, guys, those are fantastic ideas, um, but let's get back to what, what we need to do in the next month or the next week. Um, it's, very, it's a very exciting time. All right. And uh, Darcy, what do you see in your crystal ball? Um, yeah, kind of just to layer on to what Andy said, I mean, five years from now, you know, that's a lot can happen, a lot can change, <laughs> and the way technology is growing, and like you said, just what we've seen over the last even year um, to two years, it's been amazing to see some of the large players when we talk about marketing aspects um, on how large online reputation has grown and how to manage that reputation and then again convenience. I think really technology is all about convenience and you look at the way we use a lot of the different um, different programs that are available to us today and it's all about everyday convenience and staying top of mind and um, acting fast, getting what you want now. I mean, you have a cell phone with one click, you can get to iTunes, purchase a song, I mean, just something as easy as that. So, again, especially when we talk about marketing um, components and programs, it's the convenience and making sure you're connected um, where your patients are. All right, thank you. And, and Dan, the last, uh, last word is to you. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with Andy, too. It's, it's hard to predict exactly what's going to happen in five years, thinking back five years from right now um, and trying to imagine where we're at at this moment, it's, it, it's hard to get there. Uh, but it definitely planning for the future and being excited about it is, it, it is what we always think about it. I mean, think about I mean, computers keep getting smaller, uh, handheld devices get smaller or bigger depending upon which, which way you go with the device, but you can do so much more with, with everything else uh, out there right now. So, I mean, you can get a computer that's four inches by four inches that can view your 3D images. So, um, which just a couple of years ago, I would have never imagined that. So uh, it, it's an exciting time, that's for sure. All right. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, we've come to the end of our time. Thanks to everyone who joined us tonight to, uh, to listen to our, our experts. And uh, thanks very much to our panelists uh, from uh, Bright Squid, Curve Dental, Demand Force, and, and Pact One. Uh, my name is Mark Ayer. And as I said, we uh, did record this w webinar, and we'll be sending out a, a copy of that recording in the next day or two, along with the answers to any of the questions we didn't get a chance to answer today. So again, thanks so much for your time. Have a good evening, and we'll talk to you next time. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.